Hello and, and welcome to Oakville Matters. Oakville is a city that calls itself a town and acts like a village, at least if you meet the other person halfway. And uh, here on Oakville Matters, we talk about the ways we're working constantly to improve our livability and our sustainability and to make sure that it's safe for everybody in our town. Today, one of the top uh, problems that we're dealing with is a housing crisis that's been brought on by uh, population dynamics. And I've tried to explain that in several public uh, speeches, and I've never got the feeling I was really getting it across. So I've turned to Professor Rafael Gomez at the University of Toronto to help us understand the structural reasons why we have the situation that we have. Uh, Professor Gomez, thank you very much for volunteering to help us out. Uh, do you want to just set out why I turned to you? I mean, why would I turn to you? What is it about you and uh, and this topic that, that makes you the, the go-to guy? Well, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Mayor. I think I'm the go-to guy at the moment because I studied and worked alongside a very well-known Canadian economist demographer who wrote a very big best-selling book uh, in the 1990s, late 1990s, called Boom, Bust, and Echo. And we were just talking about it before we got on air, this was a seminal book. It was a bestseller, hundreds of thousands of copies sold. Now, for a generation that's been born after, uh, this name and this story might uh, either not resonate or it's sort of in the peripheral vision or in the back of the memory bank. So let's bring it to the forefront. And the, the basic story there was that there there's huge implications from understanding the demographic age structure of a country. Now, our country is particularly interesting because at the moment, we have a very unique kind of demographic uh, structure, one that's not traditional in the sense that if you heard a phrase or a term called the population pyramid, well, right there in, in itself, itself, the name denotes something uh, that, that gives off the impression that if you have a population pyramid, what you're expecting to have is a lot of young people at the base, babies, youngsters in school. And as you get up in the age brackets, there's fewer and fewer people up until We'll say there's a handful of centenarians or, or or the proportion of people in their hundreds will be less than the proportion of people in their tens and teens, right? That's a pyramid. Canada even, has no even a dramatic change. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So. Yeah. So that that's that's the traditional storyline. Now, Canada has the benefit of having longevity. And like many countries in the industrialized world, you can't call it the Western world anymore, because many countries are industrialized and high income. Uh, east, west, south, north. The, the the point is that longevity comes about because we've improved sanitation, public infrastructure. You know, it's interesting. We've come through a pandemic and we've talked a lot about how we got out of it. But in fact, you know, the thing that gives us longevity has been investments in the public realm, a good house, a good education, parks, clean water. This has added enormous amounts of longevity, not sort of the medical interventions we think are the quick fixes, Rather, it's been these public investments. Yes, healthcare is inc incredibly important, but it's the other things that have made us healthier and has allowed us to live longer. With an aging population, you'd stand to reason that the population pyramid would, over time, with improvements in, in, in these sorts of factors that I just mentioned, would shift. It wouldn't be so pyramidal. There'd be more people living longer, and therefore you'd have a, a, a less conical shape to this population pyramid. The thing that changed in our case has been the baby boom that set off an even greater number of births starting after World War II from 1945 to about the mid 60s. And then a period of which we call, if you have a baby boom, you must necessarily have something else, which is a bust. Because by definition, a boom has to be sort of preceded and also uh, uh, anticipated by a bust. And that's what happened. We had a period of rapid declines then in birth rates that fell well below what we call replacement rates. That is, if you're going to keep a population roughly the same size, you need about two births per women of childbearing age to keep that population at whatever size it is. It could be 30 million, 40 million, and so on. We fell well below that for several decades. So this, this kind of bouncing around in terms of birth rates, you can track, right? What would that effect be 20 years later on the labor market, say? Because if you have a lot of births today, what can you predict will happen 20 years from now? 20 years from now, many people will be graduating from their programs of study, education, college, university, and they'll be entering the labor force in full force. So that, that will mean that in 20 years, if you have a big baby boom now, you're going to have an increase in the labor force size, which will mean 
Again, what will be the ancillary things that you'll need to plan for? Things like transportation to get to work and things like where you're gonna live. Cause you can't live at home forever with your parents unless the house is very big and you can add additions to it. Maybe that is a sensible option for many, but by and large people like to start their own households at a certain age. So you're gonna see an increase in the demand for households. You'll see increases in demands for many other things too. What do you need to have a household? You'll need appliances, you'll need insurance. You'll need, you know, so all these other businesses and services that governments and private enterprise provide will be affected by what happens demographically 20 years ago. Now, we've had a pattern of, of, of boom, bust, and then an echo, which was the title of that very famous book that I mentioned, Boom, Bust, and Echo. Who were the echo? I told you we had falling you know, fertility rates. Fertility rates just mean how many people are born to a person of childbearing age. However, because there were so many persons of childbearing age, women uh, in the 1980s and early 90s, they had fewer kids, but because they were part of a baby boom, there were more births in Canada. So we had this blip of people who are in the millennial age, we'll call them the 30 year olds. There's a large group of those that entered the labor force about a decade and a half ago. And they are in uh, their early to mid careers, but beneath them, this is where the, the, the tightness happened. There was no further echo. There has been a decline in birth rates because A, you have fewer people of childbearing age from that bus generation. And we tended to have fewer kids now than we did 40, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, I should say, during that uh, tail end of the baby boom. And let's just go one step further. People have been working longer because of longevity, because of changes in work. When you worked a very tough job that was physically taxing, you tended to retire earlier. With the shift in the kind of work and industry that we've seen in Canada from manufacturing, primary, we'll call it industries, to tertiary or service related work, people have been able to work longer. But that's also ended. That period in which that boom generation has stayed in the labor market, it seems to, seems to have ended. The exit has happened. It would have been predicted to happen. It's accelerated a little during the COVID, the pandemic. People took stock of their life and decided probably that was the point in which they wouldn't return. So we saw a large outflow of, of labor, of forced participation. We saw the fact that because birth rates had been and fertility rates had been falling, we were going to see fewer people entering labor force. That combination post lifting of restrictions when the economy was opened up, we saw this real tightness in the labor market. It was anticipated, it was predictable. It just happened in a compressed way because we had two or three years of living through lockdowns and it was sort of not seen because we didn't have the same openness to our economy and the same demands there. So once demand kind of returned to some version of normal, the supply wasn't there, the supply of labor. And this probably gets into the next few questions we're gonna have about immigration and housing and so how that ties in. So the not only did we wind up with uh, the labor supply issue, we've also got, it follows from what you just said, that it's uh, logical and expected that we wound up with this weird housing shortage where uh, as we go to fix what's missing in the labor force, we have more people coming in and we weren't building houses. And now, boom, a crunch. So maybe the sequel is boom, bust, echo, and crunch. Uh, <laughs> this is where we are today. Yeah. What you said is rings so true for me. My wife and I, we are of a certain age. We're the start of the baby boom. Uh, she and I are each the oldest of five mm. brothers and sisters. And we have uh, among us, uh, you know, the, the, the offspring of the 10 of us, you know, mm. her and, and her four siblings and me and my four siblings. The total kids is 17 and 17 divided by 10 is 1.7. So we're under that uh, yeah. replacement level of two. Yeah. yeah. And uh, oh my God, we're contributing or our kids yeah. are, I don't know. Uh, we're yeah. contributing to the crunch. I yeah. feel guilty. Yeah, I wouldn't say so. I think the, the point is a lot of things have made life less dependent on that need for physical labor in many realms and areas. What happened though, you're right, there is an acute phase in which the, the housing crunch, for example, wasn't anticipated because we were planning with a 10, 15 year horizon and quite accurately, we were seeing that labor force growth isn't going to be the same. So housing starts are planned with some anticipation of the future. It takes th between planning and building on a greenfield site five to 10 years. And I know with your advocacy, 
if there's no environmental problems, things can get built quicker in Oakville, I'm sure. But but that's a that's a lead time. So you, you've got to make an investment on something that will be bought five to ten years later. This isn't like you know opening a restaurant and making a meal. The demand is there that day or for a few days for that food to be perishable or not. Housing has a lot of anticipation. You have to plan with some some measure of certainty because the risk is high. That's so right, and, and I find in the population, no, there doesn't seem to be any desire to understand the amount of risk that the home builders take huge. To, to meet the need. Yeah, and if so- They're really exposed for quite a number of years. They are, and interest rates can play a role in that because the break-even point for doing all that work, you have to borrow capital, physical capital, like, sorry, money capital, and then physical capital. You're leasing equipment, contracting and subcontracting to construction teams to build the work. All of that requires a lot of planning and uh, knowledge that there will be some payoff at the end. What happened, what we didn't realize is that the service sector that has taken up so much of our work requires face-to-face -face interactions. That period of the COVID was kind of important. We were already facing shortages before, but we kind of went and suspended animation for almost two years, three years. There was no immigration actually coming in then, nothing. There wasn't even travel. And then boom, we kind of with a switch opened up again. And those two or three years were vital because that normal kind of number that would come into Canada didn't. And suddenly we had a lot of people that exited the labor market for various reasons. I said, we can't call them early retirements because they were already working later than most generations. But finally that, that leading edge baby boom did retire and others just chose not to just to work again in the areas that had been shuttered and closed. So you had this gap and uh, obviously, the, the people that were supposed to move into those jobs didn't because they didn't immigrate during that time. And there was always going to be a shortage built in because of that narrowing or that falling of the birth rate and fertility rate. So what we've done is to, to sort of make up for the deficit of a few years during COVID and to make up for the falling birth rates that have been happening for 20 years, 30 years, we imported lots of workers and temporary foreign workers, students who then have kind of a working visa, which allows them to work. Um, there used to be a cap on the hours and that's been lifted. A lot of them have been incorporated into college programs that give them work experience and internships, which means they staff. But all that bulge has just come in over the last year and a half. Well, if you're gonna plan a housing development that has a five to 10 year horizon, you aren't planning for this. And, and maybe that's no one's fault, but it has to be recognized that that's the situation we're in. And you can't just ask now, let's build housing because these are temporary foreign workers and their students. Will they stay? Who are we building this housing for? I would be more comfortable if they were permanent residents or on immigration tracks to say, yes, now we can give some certainty to our builders, whether they are private, public, or some mix, that these persons want to stay here and will stay here. And that's why we're building this housing. Otherwise, it's again, a very risky proposition because then what you've done is increase the supply at a five to 10 year period when we might not need the same number of workers. And those workers might not even be here anymore because we brought them in on temporary kind of status um, uh, visas and so on. Well, we seem to be able to attract, well, here in Oakville, uh, where we've been growing very fast uh, for quite a long time, it appears to me that we get the best and brightest of the world attracted to Canada. Yes, we do. And, uh, and I think that's partly because we're so peaceable and uh, the rest of the world has decided to be so messy. Yes. Uh, to coin a phrase. Yes. But uh, it, it does seem a little short-sighted not to think more long-term. You just described yes. a situation where the, it sounds like the federal government around immigration is being very pro-TEM. Yes. And uh, it doesn't sound like, I mean, I actually have, a, my undergraduate degree was in economics. This yes. doesn't sound like good economics to me. No, it's not. It's short-term economics. It's filling gaps that the labor market seems to need, probably responding to certain constituents, but it's short term. And, and to have the right planning done that requires something like a housing strategy that's twin to immigration policy, you have to have some certainty that the numbers in which you're planning for are going to be the right ones. Because right now, the majority of this million and a half persons that have come just in the last year and a half are, are on temporary uh, uh, visas of one kind or the other, either the TFP program or as students who have been given this right to work, but when their education ends, the promise is what's brought all these great talents to our country is that they will be given the path to immigration. That's not certain. So we definitely need 
certainty. And as regards to the rest of the world, there's demographic forces there too, Rob. In India, which has now become the largest source country of our, for immigrants, they're going through an economic transition as well, a demographic transition. They still have a high fertility rate relative to say Canada, but it's much lower than it was 30 years ago. It's approaching replacement rate. In China, which had been the largest source country, they've fallen well below for 40 years because of a actual policy, which was called the one child policy, which they've since reversed or gotten rid of, but it's kind of too late. It's baked in. Society's not generating more babies because you've lifted a uh, prohibition on it. The, 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 the country's become urbanized. People live in big cities. To afford a child or second child, third child is expensive. So China's not producing uh, the kind of uh, population that would send its best and brightest out. Quite the contrary, they're shrinking. India is getting prosperous as well. So as you get more prosperous and you have fewer babies, you tend to send less people away. So our source countries, the, the thing with Canada is we think we're, we're always going to have this great supply. And, and to some extent, we are better placed than other parts of the world for the reasons you said. But other parts of the world that are maybe as safe as Canada, as rich as Canada, are now competing for the same immigrants. And, and, and the immigrants pool is shrinking because more and more countries are going through that development stage that we went through. So we have to up our game and we have to be more cognizant of making decisions that just solve short-term problems without thinking of the medium to long-term consequences. Look, what would have been the problem? We would have had labor shortages, yes. But one advantage of labor shortages, Rob, is that they force companies to be better, to invest in capital, invest in technology, and to pay workers more to bring them back into the labor force. Well, and so famously- you've suppressed, you've suppressed that ability by yeah. just injecting right now with a short-term fix, the, all these workers that have come have plugged into a lot of jobs that were at the service front end, but look at the problems it's generating. Well, it's, it's famous that Canadian companies don't invest as much as uh, other yeah. countries in uh, R&D and yeah. investment. Yeah. Uh, productivity is famously lagging. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it does look like there's been a bit of a free lunch uh, taken by some components of our, of our economy. Um, the uh, there's another train running through this that I think also is, is uh, well, it's not demographic, but I think it's got big impact. And that's the whole online digital uh, economy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Retail is, uh, bricks and yeah. mortar retail is, uh, I don't know how, the, how, it doesn't seem to be competing with online delivery. Absolutely. And, and to go back to your point, they two link up. Uh, David Foote would have said productivity is linked to demogra demographics. Do you know the first country to automate its auto industry? No accident, Japan, because it never had a baby boom. Coming out of World War II, it had high birth rates when we had low birth rates in the 1930s, the Great Depression. Japan had a high birth rate economy. Then it was booming while we were busting then. But at, coming out of the war, they had no kind of baby boom. So its large population essentially ended in 1945, its baby boom. So when do you reach kind of a peak? in terms of your life course. In fact, we you know from studies of like uh, earnings and productivity, your life course peaks around your 40s and 50s for most jobs. For an athlete that's playing professional sports, they probably peak in their mid to late 30s. But think about it. what transition does an athlete go to? They sometimes become a scout and then a coach. And when do they peak? 40s and 50s. So we kind of have a, a peak life, if you want to impact in our careers around 40, mid 40s to mid 50s. And then, and then depending on the work we do, we can even extend that and peak later for different things. But, but that's kind of the profile on average for most people in most jobs. Japan hit that in the mid 80s when it was the premier economy of the world. So productivity and demographics are linked. Japan has forced to automate and become innovative. We did have the baby boom and we had the echo. So in point of fact, yes, we didn't have those incentives to invest in R&D because we had people. But this would have been an opportune time, especially coming out of the pandemic where maybe companies would have been forced to look in the mirror and say, what can we do to make more, ourselves more productive, invest in technology? As you said, we have this whole new digital economy that's opening up. Yes, it's maybe giving a demise to retail at sort of the sort of the main street level and that kind of retail space. But what do we need in those spaces? I think we need services. I think the years in which you had to go to your physiotherapy clinic and it was in some anonymous five-story building and it was, it should be right on Main Street because that's what we need with an aging population. We need services in these former retail spaces and put them at grade level so people can access them. I think that would be a, 
a shift that could happen because you need people for those jobs. Whereas if I want to buy something, I have a choice now between online and in person, but to get my knee repaired or to fix something like my back for a chiropractor, I need a person. And that's where maybe we could reuse the spaces in different ways. Well, thank you. You've explained, uh, I, I, I didn't realize that that's what, but that's happening in Oakville. And now I understand why. Okay. Uh, so fascinating. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, so now uh, we've got the federal government telling us that they're in a year or two, we're going to be up to a half a million uh, uh, immigration a year, uh, which is up from, I don't know, 400,000. I mean, in, in the recent, in the time that I've been mayor, I think we've gone from quarter of a million to 400,000 and now we're headed to roughly half a million. Uh, you may have, uh, you may have a, gra a more granular and yeah, fine that's appreciation right. of that. That's uh, right. But uh, uh, so the the pressure on home building is, uh, in theory, going to get harder. Yeah. And the uh, and the underlying core problem is we need more workers because yeah. We, yeah. We're, yeah. we're running out. Yeah, there could be a more sustainable path to that, right? Because if we shifted and we did things like targeting the persons coming for roles that require some skill building and also work with our skilled trades and skilled professions where the shortages are most acute and where they affect us a lot um, in terms of quality of life, right? Not having enough nurses or not having enough builders to build these buildings and hospitals that we'll need and nurses to staff. If, if that's possible, and we do have methods. Canada pioneered a system of kind of point system that made our immigration more sustainable over time. We're kind of weakening that. And I'm, I'm afraid that that's the perennial problem is that we're imbalancing the, the number of people coming with the skills that the economy needs at the moment. And to provide a more sustainable path, that number too is a bit blurry because who are they counting now? We're not even, we don't even have accurate counts of the temporary foreign workers. Why? Because they've been up to now driven by employer demands. So you get Immigration Canada signing off on a request, but it's the accumulation of all these requests. No one's that kind of minding the store as to what's the total impact of saying yes to this particular employer and yes to another employer who's made the case they want to bring in temporary foreign workers. It's, it's bleeding into the numbers that you're saying are coming in as permanent residents or as immigrants. So I, I think that the, the key to making Canada the place that, as you said, that brings the best and the brightest is to think about what's happening at a demographic level, where the demands for our society are going to come from, from the fact that we are aging, and then try to link that back to whom we invite in. Because a lot of people want into Canada, and you know this is where we should be more scrupulous and invite the best and the brightest, the ones that can and also for them to have an opportunity here to make their lives better and their their children's life better, they need that too. I'm kind of shocked and disappointed to realize that the 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 active planning and comprehensive view that I always assumed the federal government was taking isn't being taken. It's kind of gone out the window for some reason. Well, for some reason, COVID shook everything up, but we we didn't return back to the programs that we were instilling, which was trying to it's not perfect. Nothing is perfect. And I think if you think about a generation earlier, the people that came to Canada certainly weren't part of these points programs. Like our, my parents came during a time in which there were high standards, but basically the, the, if you could come and work, do any job, they were happy to bring you here. Um, and whether you spoke the language or not, my parents certainly didn't. So so I think there, there's been a lot of research since then that shows immigrants can assimilate faster if you prepare them correctly and if you bring them in with the right skills that the country needs, because then both benefit, right? Source country and host country. And the immigrants have an easier time. The problem is we're bringing too many people on the false promise that they will be working in X job because they have the X skills. But once they get here, they realize X job is not available and they're doing the Y job, which is a job they could have done back home and maybe not have disrupted their entire lives and their social networks. And as I said, it's gonna be harder to bring people on those premises because their countries, their host countries are also improving, making their lives better. Their economies are evolving and rolling out in ways that I think will make it much harder for Canada to bring in the kind of numbers they even want. I don't think yeah. that's sustainable unless we do the hard work ourselves. Yeah, we've been very tough on uh, giving uh, certifying people's training in other countries, and yeah. uh, 
and, and that doesn't seem to be getting better. I mean, I've heard a lot of announcements from the from Ottawa that that, that they're going to make that better. But I, I mean, there's a big diaspora of Nigerians coming to Canada now, and many of them are settling in Oakville. And I hear from them constantly that their training and certificate and experience and certifications are not being uh, given one for one value. You know, uh, a really important part of our economy of, of our GDP measure. Is, is the whole housing industry that we were talking about before. And uh, another economist, uh, Dr. Mike Moffat, has been pointing out that in order to meet this target of uh, 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 housing the, these people that are coming in, we're, we only have to build twice as many homes a year as we have ever built in our entire history. Yeah. And that's that uh, alarms me because I think that means we need more carpenters and joiners and tapers and drywallers and framers and and uh, everything like that. Absolutely, because that's an industry where technology can only go up to a certain point. We still don't have buildings that build themselves, right? We have text and we have scripts that write themselves now with AI, right? Who knows if this is just a simulation, Rob Mayer, uh, between you and I, but, but the rest of the world, the real world needs people. And until we get that function of understanding demand and supply are intertwined, so if you want to bring this many people in, you should have planned for it with a little more anticipation. In other words, you might there might be a desire to bring in people quicker than we did in the past. Understood. There's labor shortages. Understood. But let's give ourselves at least a little bit of a head start on the housing front so that you can assimilate people, have them in decent housing situations. And so why? So they stay. And so they just don't go back. And we have this sort of hamster wheel of people coming, feeling discouraged. And then we have to even bring in more people to account for the fact that so many people are, are returning. And that's a potential problem. Well, in the seconds that we have left, literally seconds, yeah. I, I guess we have to close off. The, I can tell you that we're building homes in Oakville as fast as we've ever built them. But that's only half of what uh, Dr. Moffat says we need. Yeah. And, uh, so Because of the know, urgency, right? Rationalizing yeah. our immigration situation and our whole... Uh, population structure. Yeah, uh, I think we need to have another show on this. Would you Would you be willing to come back? Sure, part two. Maybe look at solutions. Right, we've diagnosed a lot of the problems. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, let's do that. And uh, thanks for that. And thank you for joining us. And I look forward to seeing you next time on Oakville Matters.